Hello. So tonight I want to I want to explore something that uh, I know and I sometimes remember, but I want to deepen in my own mind. Um, <laughs> there's there's this I am, I'm gonna have to be pretty careful here. So for me, a lot of the challenge for me today is going to be that. Like, I, I learn a lot by teaching. Hmm. I think there's a, there's a version of teaching what I need to learn as an avoidance for me internalizing it. But sometimes there's, I actually deepen it best by offering it to other people. Like me having the sense of viewing from the outside what someone needs to hear helps me to articulate it in a way that helps it to land for me as well. And distinguishing between those two is um, like I haven't made a habit of being consistent with that. So that's going to be my challenge here. I'm, I want to teach or rather share something that is very clear to me, is very important, and that uh, I don't I don't fully embody. <laughs> For me, the whole point is embodying it. So I want to go over this a bit to ground this more in my body. So the um, the direction that I'm looking in, and part of this came from a couple of conversations that I had today. Uh, in one, I was explaining to somebody a piece that I had gotten from uh, uh, one of my teachers, Perry Chase, where she summarized something that I had been seeing and it had been bugging me and then she just clicked it into place and I went, ah, that's the name of the thing. Okay, great. Um, so the, uh, um, the, this is in the context of what do we do to save the world? Or what can I do to really help the people around me? Um, I was highlighting in, in a, several different examples how there's a really basic problem with getting any sense of meaning or value from solving a problem. Because it means that once that happens, there's no longer, there, there's now a, a, a pull toward, um, uh, like you, you can't afford to solve the problem. If your sense of meaning or value is coming from there being a problem you are fighting, Well, you dare not win. <laughs> because then what? I got skewered by this quite a lot. I threw um, well over a decade of a lot of energy into trying to make the world sane. And in retrospect, I noticed there were a lot of behaviors that I engaged in that were from me wanting to focus on the sense of value and meaning that I was making from engaging in the process instead of actually solving the problem. Because if I solved the problem, if I actually succeeded in creating this widespread thing that had the human race clean up its issues, um, I could see mentally why that would make sense. But the energetics at the basic emotional level couldn't get on board with that. There is this hop of fear of but then I won't matter. And regardless of what I think, that pain, that discomfort, defined the context of my energy for moving forward. This is um, the basic challenge that I would put forward towards most modern activism. Most modern activism is a method of making meaning by fighting a foe. That doesn't mean there isn't a problem, but it does mean that there's a really big challenge in that as soon as you define an enemy and you get value out of your fighting the enemy, you dare not win. This is not universally true. Like clearly the allies won against the Axis in World War II that got to a survival level where you dare not lose and you dare not tally be, dally because there's, there's 
uh, eradication becomes possible. Um, but what I'm describing is not about something that is absolute. I'm just uh, at the mechanical level. I am describing the way in which incentives appear. As soon as there is meaning from the fight, as soon as, as soon as I get a sense of value from my struggles with, it becomes, um, th there becomes a reason for me not to win, but to continue the struggle. So I can tell myself that I mean it all I want to, but there is still this subconscious nudge. I really meant for every conscious bit in my fiber, I meant I really wanted to address the kind of insanity that I was seeing across the globe. I really wanted to fix it. And it hasn't been until the last half year or so that I've actually really taken in the implications of me framing it as something that I had to fix, that I could fix, that others are living their lives wrong, that the human race is existing wrong, and that I know better. I see something that I prefer. But I observe that my naming it as clearly as I can doesn't immediately cause everybody to suddenly do this new thing. So that means I'm missing something about what is important to people. Maybe my vision has some real value to it. I think it does. I have not encountered anything to say that it doesn't. Nothing really meaningful, nothing about the content. But the transition matters, and accounting for that transition matters. So that's one piece, this business of, um, like it, it speaks to a more general law, this general rule of I, <laughs> this, I have to go in a kind of philosophical direction to point at the thing that I mean. Um, we have much less free will than we pretend. Like, I pretend that I can, anytime I want to, just call up any of my friends or shoot them an email. But I notice that in practice, there's this whole emotional rigmarole I have to go through in terms of taking the time to do it and sitting down and choosing to write the email. And often I'm just not up to it. Why am I not up to it? Oh, because of the energy that I have available in my body. What controls when I have energy? This is not about uh, philosophical determinism. I'm not trying to speak, I'm, I'm not trying to go into, according to this frame, and we live in this frame, of course, in the scientific materialist worldview, in this frame, there are, is no extra thing that could be free will. It's all just laws of physics bouncing around, and therefore there's no free will. I mean, that's, that's a fine way to generate the hypothesis. But what I'm talking about is a lived experience. The experience I have of being able to choose things mostly is my mental ignorance of the mechanisms that cause things to happen the way they do. As I learn more mechanisms, I notice more and more places where I don't need to pour my energy into pretending that I can make something different happen because I can't. Or if I can make something different happen, I see how. And then the question retreats to, well, where is the point of leverage? So for instance, uh, me, I, like, I, I went through months of not being able to have any kind of exercise program. I'm a very physically active person. I naturally have a desire to move my body. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and I care a lot about this body. I want it to be healthy. So um, for me, I, I don't have to struggle with that part. That's just a quirk of me. I've always been like that. But I still went months not being able to do exercise for mechanical reasons. I kept running into problems with shoulder impingement and um, iliotibial band syndrome for the knees and a kind of tear in the, uh, the lower abdomen. All kinds of difficulties showed up. And I would do research to try to figure out ways to get around each of these problems. And I would try resting in order to hope that maybe all the inflammation or whatever would calm down and I just couldn't sort through it. What eventually sorted through it was recognizing that there is basically a kind of intelligence in the background 
to how all of these problems kept appearing, and then addressing that intelligence. Today, the usual way we talk about this, I don't know about we usually, but a lot of people I hear in my social circles um, talk about this in terms of processing trauma or uh, doing shadow work. They're just different names for the same process. But the, the essence of this is noticing for quite a while there, I did not have the option of doing exercise. This is not a matter of willpower. This is a matter of leverage. Where can I apply intention? Where do I direct my awareness to create the effect that I want? And just as importantly, where does the desire come from? What's driving the desire? Why do I feel frustrated? What's driving the frustration? So that's a cluster. I realize I skipped around several different topics, but I'm trying to outline a category here. There is this experience of trying to do things, trying to save the world, trying to help other people, trying to exercise, uh, like there's this huge category of trying to, where most of the trying, most of the effort is made of illusion. I'm not saying that there is no such thing as free will. I think there is something like it. I'm not highly confident about this and doesn't fit in the physics model, but neither does consciousness, so whatever. Um, <laughs> so the, um, at least as the model currently stands, it, you can't see that it's actually included in the extension. Um, but uh, there's this, this, this recognition that the more I see, the more clearly I see, the more I recognize I don't have to use this computation of ignorance in order to try to force things to happen. It's like applying pain inside, like, I should just exercise. I should eat better. I should write that email. This is how it often appears in me. Like, why aren't I taking care of these things? Oh, because I'm trying to be restful. Am I doing that part right? Ah, oh, am I screwing up everything? Like, there's, like that, that pain is something like, well, I don't know how to make a certain thing happen, so maybe I can just increase the pressure. There's a mechanism, which frankly is automatic too. I mostly don't have conscious control over this. I have the experience of conscious control of my reaction to the inner pain. And sometimes I catch it when the machine starts to rev up, but it's like a machine. I experience it like this machine, it just goes. So that's a cluster. Um, you know, maybe, maybe that cluster actually captures um, where I wanted to go with this today. No, there, there's another piece I want to talk about, this, this other dimension. There's a, a second conversation I had, um, actually just wrapped up about half an hour ago. Um, where, um, I won't go into, I think, all the details of the context of the conversation, but the, uh, um, there was one part where in trying to point out a piece of experience about how I relate to the experience of what I call mind, this sort of inner computer, this, this thing that I ask it questions and it answers. And I bet you know this experience. Almost everybody has this from what I can tell. There's, it, it's the a type of thing that goes, um, where was I this last Christmas? And there's an effort involved. And that effort results in something what I'm calling the mind, something receiving the request and then producing an answer. Uh, sometimes the answer is immediate, sometimes it takes a bit of a delay, like, what was that person's name? Uh, I don't remember. And then 10 minutes later, John! Oh, <laughs> that person's name was John. How did I not remember a name like John? Um, <clears throat> I, but the it's the thing that takes in the request through that kind of effort and then produces an answer which then 
I evaluate, I decide whether that's the right answer. Yeah, that person's name was John. Or no, no matter how many times I think his name is James, it's not James, it's something else. What is it? Try again, brain. No, it's still not James. Try again, brain. There's this, like almost like, we, we, most people don't experience this as having a conversation. They're often very fused with the experience of the mind. And this is, this gets close to the center of the issue that I'm working with here. So this is just providing a bit of background. The, um, there is in fact this bit of distance in the lived experience. We just often skip over this. It's become more and more vivid the more I um, choose to pay attention to it. So there's this issue of like my, my mind, my mind in particular, is an amazingly powerful tool for navigating the world, interpreting it, making sense of it. When I say that, I want you to hear and feel what I'm saying. I'm, I'm not just saying, look at me, I'm smart. I'm saying, oh, I seem to have a very smart mind. This is an immense tool. I've used it. I wasn't responsible for building it. And I enjoy it quite a bit. I've mentioned this a few times in, in these videos. So I just I want to invite you to feel and hear this clearly because there's, this is this doing the opposite that doing you see i'm really smart you know, like, that's that's like that's doing the fusion it's it's confusing the asker with the mind i want to very intentionally keep those separate but because for me in particular how strong my mind is and because of some kind of automatic thing that I have not gotten down to the roots of yet. I've not been able to trace all the way down yet. Um, I have a guess about the historical event that caused this, but consciously knowing about that hasn't stirred the guts and had the thing digest, so this is a trick. But I, I very often live in the world of my mind and I ask my mind what to do next and I let its computations tell me what to do. This is, um, I, re I really liked uh, uh, Perry's metaphor for this. Uh, uh, this is sort of like um, asking my calendar what I should do with my life. <laughs> it's a calendar, it's a tool. Um, I can see that very clearly when I ground. So there's this particular piece, the, the content of the conversation was not just me highlighting this difference, but also talking about uh, the fact that there is knowing and the knowing is not in the mind. So this is very central to basically all of the work that I do. It's a little slippery for me to embody. This is exactly the place where it's hard for me. Which is part of why I teach it. And part of why I talk about it. Um, <clears throat> hey, Jake. Uh, Jake Myers says, uh, the mind is a wonderful servant but a terrible master. You just heard that quote today. Yeah. <clears throat> um, you might get a kick out of also... Uh, the um, uh, Ian McGilchrist's book, The Master and His Emissary, uh, is uh, like the master is the right hemisphere and the emissary is the left hemisphere of the brain. Uh, he's breaking it down. I, I, I don't remember whether you and I have talked about this before or not. Um, it, uh, uh, McGilchrist um, breaks down the usual way of splitting the brain into the left and right hemispheres and says, this is not what the science says. The common ideas are wrong. But here's what the differences actually seem to be, and this actually seems to be pretty relevant. Um, I bring that up because when I say mind, I'm approximately referring to, best as I can tell, the functions of the left hemisphere, which is the emissary. And uh, the whole premise of the whole book, The Master and His Emissary, is that sometimes the emissary confuses itself for the master. And this has dire consequences that are very observable. So, yeah. The mind is a wonderful servant, but a terrible master. Absolutely. 
So there's this very specific movement inside that helps me to have right relationship with my mind. It's the same movement I use to use it, in fact. It's always there. I just keep missing it when I believe my mind's claims that it knows what I should be doing. So one place this shows up is, for instance, uh, you look at, like, I, I look at something like a syllogism, like um, all men are mortal, Socrates is a man, therefore Socrates is mortal. And I look at that and I can say, yes, the structure of the logic is correct. This, all blurgs are flibble. Uh, John is a flibble, therefore John is a blurg. I don't have to know what uh, flibble or blurg or John mean. The structure of the argument works. That's what formal logic is. Um, so there's a question. How do I know that the reasoning is correct? How do I know that the logic is true? It can't be because I studied it before. That's what makes it easily accessible. That's what allows my mind, this, this servant, to readily access it and keep track of it. I have, I have a skill with keeping track of it, but that's something that the mind does for me. How did I know which patterns were correct in the first place? Why did I learn those ones instead of the mistaken ones? All men are mortal, Socrates is immortal, therefore Socrates is a man. And so how, do, how is it that I can catch the fact that, well, Socrates being a man is a correct statement, it's a true statement, but the logic is wrong. How do I know that? How do I do it? It's not because of a computational theory, because then this just it just iterates the question. How when I come up with a computational theory, how do I know that that theory is correct? And when my mind produces it as the answer to the question, how do I know that my mind's um, produced answer is correct? I can play this game all day where I can ask my mind over and over again, wait, how do I know? And then the mind gives me another answer. But then how do I know about that answer? And then I can ask my mind and then it gives me another answer. I can play this game all day. This is the Western mental ping pong. Western minds are well, Western cultures train people to relate to their minds this way. I'm starting to uh, suspect that this is something that men in particular get especially trained in. I don't know how that happens, but as I've floated in um, spaces that emphasize uh, what kinds of things uh, men need in order to ground in their bodies as opposed to what women need to ground in their bodies. Um, it sounds like this particular issue is a more central one for men, for people who have more experience helping people. I don't have an in-depth theory about why that would be, or, and I don't know if that's true, but it seems worth mentioning. So, This, this closely relates to something I've mentioned in many previous videos about there being two directions to go in when asking a question. One is the direction of answering and the other is in the direction, one is in the direction of answering the question in an articulable way and having a correct theory. And the other is the direction of answering a koan and looking at truth. They're not mutually exclusive, but I find that if I do the first one, I get lost. If I do, the, if, if I do that first one I named first, I get lost. So a, a very grounded example is, can you feel your feet? The answer going up is, Yes, or maybe no, maybe you can't feel your feet, but most people have a, an experience of, oh, right, I didn't, wasn't thinking of my feet at all. I wasn't aware of them. But now that 
you've mentioned them. Yes, I am aware of my feet. But that's the second thing that happens. The first thing that happens is what causes the disorientation, sense of, whoa, I'm experiencing my feet now. That's the movement down. How do you know you can experience your feet? How do you know, rather, how do you know you are experiencing your feet? When you go down into the sensations, it's a silly question. You answer the question by experiencing your feet. That's what it means to know you're experiencing them. That's not using what I'm calling the mind. That's just being here. Then there's this, like the, the direction where I might go, well, um, I know I'm experiencing my feet because when I, when I hear the question, and then I do the sensory accessing, I get this neural impulse back and um, from um, comparing that to lots of past experiences of my body and lots of anticipations, my brain's model of my body uh, compares to the question and I come up with an answer, something like that. Like I might have some of the details of the computational model wrong. Do you notice how thinking like that disconnects from the experience of the feet? <laughs> I mean, maybe for you it doesn't. And I find that there's a particular move I can do that is the thinking instead of experiencing move. It's up instead of down. That's asking the mind. So making this really clear distinction between what does it mean for me to ask my mind to answer my questions for me versus me looking. And who exactly am I? Well, I'm not going to answer that question in too much detail here. Um, it just seems like an important piece of experience to orient to. So I, I spell all of that out because to me these, these two things, this bit about where is actual free will, it's a lot less expansive than I thought, it's, uh, than, than I might be inclined to think, than I habitually think. And if I'm honest, I recognize, you know, I actually don't have nearly as much freedom as I tend to think. And that's an important hint. As a lot of this is coming from the mind's model of its environment and of itself. And then there's this other side of I'm seeing. If I, if I do this particular move of grounding, I can see my mind. <laughs> Wanting to take a moment to do some of that grounding myself here. It's really slippery for me. It's really slippery. I have this um, immense habit of asking my mind everything. Letting my mind guide me through everything. And I can see why that creates problems. I don't want that. I'm so tempted to go, so how do I deal with that? But when I ask that question, by default, I go up. I ask the mind, so how do I unengineer the mind? And then my mind comes up with this model of itself as an icon in order to do that computation. But that icon is not reflective of the truth for the same reason why. It's exactly the same reason why I keep getting these impressions of like why I ever ask myself questions like why don't I just keep up with all the email messages I get? Ah, I could just sit down and respond to them. Well, demonstrably I can't because I don't. That's true. So that means that thought is actually a description of my own ignorance. I'm using ignorance as kind of a double meaning here. There's a, like, there's stuff I don't know that I mentally just do not have the information of. But uh, ignorance has its root in the word ignore. It's, it's, it's a habit of ignoring, ignorance. 
Of course, if you ignore something long enough, you're not going to know a whole lot about it. <laughs> so I can see why it, why the meaning evolved the way it did. So, to me, one of the most important practical questions is where do I actually have choice? Where do I actually have choice? Right. Um, that question like holds the possibility of maybe nowhere. Maybe nowhere. But this gets back to this thing about incentives that I was talking about before. There's a, there's a problem. There's a big problem here. If I value my free will, if I think it's important, if I, if I get meaning out of the fact that I can choose what I do, then I cannot afford to take seriously the experiential possibility that I have no free will. So, in order for me, to, you know, the, it's worth noting there's, a, there's an effect here where if, as this whole machine continues to understand itself better, if the mind does this computation and it figures out how it works and concludes it is all mechanistic, there is no freedom, even this impression of there being some kind of separation, uh, that itself is actually an echo of a layer of confusion, and that when there's no more confusion, there's no more even impression of free will. Right? If that's true, then it's already true, and I just haven't seen it. And the conscious experience, whatever that is, but the conscious experience includes a bunch of suffering due to ignorance of that. So it doesn't help me to avoid it. In fact, the whole system could be so much more efficient. So much more efficient if instead of operating under ignorance, it were operating under knowledge of the lack of choice. Then it can just run its optimization powers. It can just figure out how to do the things that it wants to do. The same way that a computer, like if I, if I ask my computer to open my internet browser, it doesn't have to figure out what the meaning of life is in order to do so. It doesn't have to figure out whether it wants to or not. There's a very mechanical process, and the more streamlined that mechanical process is, the faster and more reliably the web browser can boot up. So to the extent that I want to say anything like I care about something, the actual act of caring would be to fully take in the complete lack of freedom, as true as it is, even if that's 100%. That's the logic of it. <laughs> that's the logic. But if I have in here this belief, this attitude, a sort of energy, that I get value out of the experience of choice, then whether or not this is true, I can't risk looking. Because if I look, I might find I have no choice anywhere. The capacity for choice will dissolve, and the meaning and value that I get from having that sense of free will will evaporate. The anticipation of that pain means that at a very deep level, at an energetic level, at a somatic level, I cannot afford to learn the truth. Whatever I might consciously think, those energies, those fears and cringes actually drive what kinds of shapes and mechanisms happen in the mind. So, somehow, I have to be willing to prefer the truth, even if it's what I don't want.
because otherwise I'm stuck in a delusion. I'm not really stuck after a while reality will destroy me <laughs> because uh, like the reason a delusion is a problem is because it is out of touch with truth and I can't adapt to reality. And this is uh, like something like taking evolution seriously. <laughs> evolution at all of the levels. So, and this gets right back to this game of where am I leading my life from? It's important to recognize that the mind, the thing I'm calling the mind, it actually always is mechanistic. If there is any point of free will in existence, it's going to be close to the center, to where the consciousness emanates from. It might be consciousness. If there is no choice anywhere in the system, doesn't matter that, that well there's no choice anywhere in the system it definitely isn't in the mind and if there is choice in the system I can still see it's not in the mind the mind is reacting the mind is a machine this is very transparent so the mind is not the point of influence guaranteed the mind is a resource it is a tool I can see, because of that, very clearly, that um, the process of clarifying the system requires standing and orienting from outside of mind, from the place where knowing happens. In a previous video, I talked about I serve clear knowing. This is a piece of what I mean, that my direction forward has to do with embodying this more fully and inviting others for whom this resonates to do the same and showing that kind of pathway forward. But it's that it's me. It's about focusing on me and I embody it and that uh, that lives an example, lives an example. Although hopefully I can give some clear instructions too <laughs> for those who want it. That's definitely the direction I'm moving in. There is one other thing to say. This is going to take a moment for me to rest in. The place I stand outside of mind is very still. When I speak from here, it doesn't feel to me like I have a plan about what I am saying. There's more of a sense of getting out of the way. It's a little tricky. <laughs> There's definitely an effort to it. But it's the effort of, uh, it's like correcting posture. After a while, body posture becomes habitually new. So I think it's a matter of familiarity. Hmm. <sighs> I think that's what I have for today. An invitation. An invitation if you, um, it's, it's totally a practice, a set of practices that go with, um, with what I'm looking at today. And if you want to play with this, there's an invitation. 
notice So the general thing is to notice what the incentives are around why you do what you do. What I'm looking at there is um, like when I lean in to help someone, when uh, when somebody uh, asks a question and then wants uh, some help, or uh, um, Maybe a better example, maybe a clear example is um, um, like when, when someone complains on one of the social spaces I hang out in about um, having some difficulty with her partner and feeling kind of sad and embittered about it. And then I want to lean in and say, oh, here's like, I, I see what, what you could use here. Here's a thing that you that I think could help you. It's a, a very basic starting place for me to recognize why I do that and where I'm coming from is just to notice what is the energy that arises in me? Is this savior energy? Am I rescuing her? Am I treating her like she is incapable of living her life well if I don't come in and intervene? Am I avoiding noticing that? Often there's an answer of yes, this is a habit that I am slowly dissolving. I would love to learn how to reach down into the roots. I've had a number of people claim to me methods of reaching into the roots and I haven't, haven't quite been able to do it. It hasn't quite worked. So there's like a mechanism there that I don't understand. It's not in my range of... <laughs> The variation I have in my impression of free will does not let me reach that deep into the dirt. Yet. So, that's the first level, is noticing, oh, I'm rescuing. Um, you look up Karpman's triangle, or the victim triangle, in order to get a sense of the most likely roles here. Uh, rescuer, um, persecutor, or victim, are the most common ones. Once I've identified that, I find it helpful to mentally notice, oh, wait, what are, well, sorry, not to mentally notice, to directly notice and then put into mind so that the mind can help to serve this process and can help to churn this more and more. What were the incentives that made it make sense for me to summon that energy? A common way of saying this is what triggered that energy in me. But this is not about, was this done to me? Did someone trigger me? Did a situation trigger me as though it was inflicted upon me, which is more victim energy? Uh, the, there's a whole question set about why did I end up in that situation? Why did I lean into that particular thing? What is the context of how I live my life such that I am encouraging myself to continue to play out this rescuer role. What am I secretly getting out of it? What am I secretly hoping to get out of it? And just to catch myself if I'm trying to self-flagellate and go, oh yeah, I'm so terrible in this particular, okay. That's more mental reactivity. But if I set aside the thoughts and I am in the stillness and I look, why do I do it? What are the incentives? I find that once I see the incentives of a system, my behavior absolutely makes sense. This is true of all beings. Everyone's behavior makes complete sense. It is absolutely the most clear-minded, open-hearted thing that person could be doing in that situation. It's also the most evil, vindictive, asshole-ish thing they could be doing in that situation. Everything is precisely as it should be because that's how it is. Any disagreement with that is, a, is the degree to which you don't see what's true. I'm not saying this is the best of all conceivable worlds according to any given ego. I am saying the present moment is what is real, and it's here for reasons. 
that if you believe that the present reality shouldn't be here and there is an emotional reactivity to that, uh, that's living in a fantasy of the mind. So it's worth asking, what incentivizes living in the fantasy? Can you see it? If that exercise, that exploration doesn't make sense to you, that's okay. I could stand to crisp it up. I can feel how, um, from a, like as a teacher, I can feel how that exercise needs crisping up. It's not nearly as clean as a lot of the other, not, not nearly as sharp as a lot of my other exercises. Uh, so that could use some polishing. So it requires a little bit of insight in order for you to engage in. If you don't know how to do that, that's perfectly fine. Um, but if you still want to play with this, just notice this gap. Notice the gap between you and your mind. Notice when you're asking yourself, like, who is yourself? Usually when you ask yourself something, at least one of those roles is the mind. Often it's the mind talking to itself. But sometimes when you are trying to remember or you are trying to think, you are the asker. And the trying to think is asking or using the mind. Just watch. Just see that interaction. And that's all I've got for today. Thank you for listening.